Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The word translated as wiles, number 3180, means cunning arts, deceit, craft, trickery. The word translated as devil, number 1228, means false accuser, slanderer. So this is literally saying, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the cunning arts, deceit, and trickery of the false accuser. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, in high places. The word translated as principalities, number 746, means beginning, origin, leader, the active cause. So this is saying we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, in other words, people, but against the origin, leader, or the active cause of the bad thing. That word active is crucial because it means that we wrestle against the present cause. In other words, the cause of a bad thing that is currently active. So while it's important to understand the origin in a historical sense, we are not really wrestling against the past cause of our problems, but the active cause of our problems. And again, it says the active cause of our current problems is not flesh and blood. In other words, it's not the flesh and or the blood of a person that is the problem. And that is calling out those who have racist or genocidal ideologies. It is not the flesh or the blood DNA of a person that we wrestle against, but instead the active cause. That's important. Then verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So this is a direct message to those who are standing in the evil day. The evil day we know occurs in the end when the dragon is cast to the earth. In other words, it's talking directly to our generation from 1947 until now. We'll talk about that later. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. The word translated as righteousness, number 1343, means integrity, virtue, justice that is acceptable to God. So this is saying, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of integrity, virtue, and justice that is acceptable to God. The loins are protected by truth. Your loins hold your seed. So this is saying you can protect your seed with the truth. Jesus told us to read Daniel, and Daniel says they will mingle with your seed in the last days. We know Daniel's prophecy is truth because these events have occurred exactly as written millennia after they were published. So when we understand the truth in these prophecies, which tell us someone is mingling with our seed, and that mingling is the mating with humans by the sons of God that fall to earth, then we understand why the shielding around our loins or seed is the truth. We're given a fairly clear timeline of when this mingling with the seed occurs. Daniel 8.10 tells us the army of the stars, the oppressors, will fall to the earth at the time of the little horn. Revelation 12.9 tells us it is the dragon who falls to the earth, and this occurs after the war in the sky, which we know was World War II, which ended in 1945. Daniel 2.43 tells us they mingle with the seed of humans at the time of the feet, which occurs after the rise of the final beast 
which is the eighth king. Genesis 6-4 tells us it is the Nephilim who will come down to the earth to mate with humans and have children with them when humans begin to multiply on the earth which occurred between 1927 and 1960. The truth of the seed goes even deeper than that. We're told in Genesis 3 that a hybrid was created using a cell from the humans, and these hybrid beings would marry the humans and be chosen for marriage based upon their beauty, which is not a natural beauty, but an image technology. And again, we're told this happened when the branch of the fig tree was sown. Hosea 9.10 tells us the fig tree is Israel, and Israel became a nation in 1947. This is a deep mystery in the Bible, the mystery of the Isha, the hybrids. Eve was not a human being. We've talked about this before. The Bible tells us Adam is the humans, and Eve is is the Isha, which are hybrids, and it tells us this marriage is occurring now. It is the rattling of the feet in Isaiah 3.16. The shield over your loins is the truth. In other words, the knowledge of the truth, which is that humans are being bred out of Earth's population. The flesh of the hybrids will be chosen In other words, they will be chosen for their beauty and they will marry the humans. Genesis 2.23 Certain men crept in unawares, going after strange flesh. Jude 1.4-8 Israel, in other words, the descendants of Jacob, the smooth one, the homo sapiens, are defiled and have begotten strange children. Hosea 5, 3, 5, and 7. They bring up their children, but there shall not be a human left. Hosea 9, 12. The knowledge of this truth in the Bible will protect your loins. You are given a shield of truth to protect your seed. Then Ephesians 6.15 says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Notice it says the gospel of peace as opposed to just saying the gospel. Many people who may follow the writings of the gospel in the Bible are not following the gospel of peace, but rather the gospel of war. Hosea 14 verse 9 says, The just will walk in the ways of the Lord, while the transgressors are shall fall in the ways of the Lord. This is confirmed many times throughout the Bible. In fact, the author of Ephesians 6, Paul, said himself in Romans 1 verses 18 through 23 that those who know God became vain in their imaginations and in professing themselves wise, they became fools. And this part is important. They changed the glory of of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts. This is an important clue because in Daniel 2, we're told the image is made up of five parts which directly correlate to the four beasts in Daniel 7. The image is the serpent by definition, in Genesis 3. The serpent is the dragon, and the dragon gives power to the beast, as explained in Revelation 12 and 13. So Paul is saying in Romans 1 that those who know God, those who profess themselves wise, in other words, the leaders of the churches, became vain in their own ideologies, which came from their own imagination, not the Bible. We've talked about their false doctrines many times. I've proven some of their doctrines false in my playlist, false doctrines, and we've talked about how their doctrines do not match what the texts themselves say. In other words, their doctrines are not in alignment with the Word of God. So their doctrines are in alignment with their own 
ideas, their own imaginings. And it says here that they, those who know God, changed God into the image of which is the beast. This, again, is confirmed in Hosea 13, Daniel 7, and Revelation 13. It says, Yahweh will be the beast to the tares. And it confirms in chapter 14 that the just will walk in the ways of Yahweh, but the tares will fall in the ways of Yahweh. So Romans 1 is telling us it is actually some of the church leaders who will fall. It's those who know God, who profess themselves wise. So when it says in Ephesians 6.15 that our feet should be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, that word peace is important because not everyone who follows the gospel is following the teachings of peace. Some of them follow the teachings of war. This is confirmed in Romans 1 verse 32 when it says, those who know the judgment of God, who know that those who commit certain acts are worthy of death, they not only do the same things that those others do, but they also take pleasure in the people who do those wicked acts. So it's telling us that those who know God are not only committing the same acts as those they condemn, but they are also taking pleasure in the people that they condemn. So that's confirmation again that those who know God, those who turned God into a beast, in other words, the tares who are falling in the ways of Yahweh, are taking pleasure in wicked people. And the Bible is also clear that those wicked people have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They're called the remnant, which literally means those left behind. We'll get to that in a minute. So Ephesians 6.15 says, Part of your armor is having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So your feet, in other words, the way you walk should be in peace. Walk in the ways of peace. Do not fall in the ways of war. Then verse 16 says, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The word translated as faith, number 4102, means belief with the predominant idea of trust or confidence. So this is saying, above all, taking the shield of trust and confidence in God, with which you will be able to quench, in other words, extinguish the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The word translated as salvation, number 4992, means the hope of future salvation. So this is saying, and take the helmet of the hope of future salvation. In other words, the hope of the future rescue, the saving that we are told will occur when the stars fall, which is the impact of the giant meteorite. That is your helmet, the hope of the future rescue. The helmet of that hope covers your head, which is where you will hopefully receive a crown at the time of the rescue. In Revelation 2.10 and 3.11, we are told that some will receive a crown of life. And behold, I come quickly so that no one can take your crown. In other words, the one who is going to rescue you is coming quickly so that no one can take your life. We're also told in Revelation 12 that the woman wears a crown upon her head and the dragon persecutes the woman after it's cast to the earth, but the woman escapes from the face of the serpent and after that escape, the dragon will make war with the remnant who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is important because the Bible is telling us that some will escape 
and others will be left behind. In Matthew 13, 30, Jesus said the tares will be bound in bundles in order to be burned before the wheat are gathered into the barn. That means the tares are together before the burning. And we know what the burning is. Second Peter tells us it is the burning of the earth. And we're also told what causes the burning of the earth. It's the meteorite, the burning star that falls from heaven and hits the earth. This is what kills the beast after the beast is allowed to continue for a final 42 months. The wheat are also called the elect in Matthew 24, 31. They will be gathered by the angels. Luke 17 says one will be taken and the other left. And specifically in verse 37, it says they will be taken to where the eagles gather together. Revelation 12 says the woman will fly into the place prepared by God by the wings of a great eagle. That place that is prepared by God is where they will feed the woman. The place that is prepared by God is called the Father's house in John 14. The Father's house is where the throne is, which is in heaven. It's where the body of Christ will be gathered together. Revelation 7, 9 says it will be a great multitude of people of all nations who cannot be counted, who will stand before the throne, and the Lamb, who is Jesus, will feed them. Revelation 11 tells us that the ethnos is the multitude. It was translated as Gentiles, but it means multitude. It's a multitude of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues that cannot be counted. This is important because Revelation 11 tells us the ethnos or multitude will not be measured. The measurement of the temple, it makes clear, is also the measurement of the people. The people are the temple. The people are the body. The eagles will carry the woman, which is the multitude, which is the body. Therefore, the eagles will gather where the body is. In other words, where the multitude is, where the throne is. Revelation 11 clarifies that the multitude will walk the holy city for 42 months, and Revelation 21 explains that the holy city is in heaven, and those in the holy city are the bride, which is the woman in Revelation 12. That bride or woman or multitude will escape at the start of the final 42 months, Revelation 11:2. And at that time, the dragon will make war with the remnant who have the testimony of Jesus Christ, Revelation 12, 17. Matthew 22, 6 through 8 says the remnant stay behind. I'm sorry, because they're not worthy. That's what it says. I probably should not be sorry for what Jesus said because it isn't me who said that. It's Jesus who said that. Matthew 21, 43 says the kingdom of God will be taken from them and given to those bringing forth the fruits. It's those who worship the beast who will be left behind on the earth, Revelation 13, 8. The beast is Yahweh, Hosea 13, Revelation 13. Revelation 17 tells us that Babylon the Great, the woman sitting on the beast, brag and say that they are no widow. In other words, they say God is not dead and they are married to him. Luke 21, 36 says to pray, to be accounted worthy. But the tares do not pray, they brag. Isaiah 61, 6 prophesied that the priests of the Lord, who people will call ministers of God, will boast themselves in their glory. Isaiah 10, 15 explains that they are like an axe that boasts itself against the person who heweth it. They are like a saw which magnifies itself against the person who shakes it, as if the rod should shake itself, or the staff should lift itself. This is about the ministers of God who boast that they and their followers are 
saved. They lift themselves up. They are the rod who thinks it can lift itself up. Psalm 10.3 says the wicked are the ones who are blessing the covetous. They boast and bless the covetous whom God abhors. It's clarifying here that the ministers of God are the wicked. They bless people. They boast that God has saved them, which shows that they do not know nor do they understand the prophecies that they profess to be wise about. Because the prophecies say that the saving has not occurred yet. It is a physical rescue that will occur at the time the stars fall. At the time of the giant meteorite, the burning stone from heaven. James 4 says they rejoice in their boasting and that rejoicing is evil. They rejoice that God has saved them when God has not saved anyone yet. It is the ministers who have blessed them in their false imaginings. So in Ephesians 6, 17, where it says to wear the helmet of salvation. It is literally speaking of the hope of future salvation. It's saying, wear the hope that you will be rescued and pray that you will be accounted worthy of that rescue. The multitude will be given a crown when they are rescued. That crown, we're told in Revelation 2.10, is the crown of life. Revelation 3.11 says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no one take thy crown. In other words, hold on to your helmet. And what is your helmet? It is the hope of future salvation. In other words, the hope that you will be among the multitude of all nations that will be rescued. Then verse 17 adds that your sword is the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. This is truth. We know this is truth because it is in harmony with the rest of the prophecies which are coming true. This armor was given to you from God as protection from the enemy. For more information about where we are in the biblical timeline, you can watch the playlist Bibles Countdown to the Meteorite and Rescue linked here. Thank you to those who make this work possible. If you like this video, please consider providing support. I hope you're doing well, and I will talk to you next week.